Good morning to everyone. I'm Marcia Mode Stavros, a practitioner here at Light on the Mountains. And I am so happy to be here. What a beautiful morning for those of you who are not in this room. Um, it's a soft, moist, gorgeous morning. I don't know if it's spring or summer, but it is a dandy. Um, I invite you to go into that place where you connect with your oneness and find renewal and restoration. I know there's an incredible life force, Father, Mother, Spirit, God, the isness, the allness, the order behind the cosmos. I know this life force to, all be, to be all renewing, all restoring, all sustaining. And I give grateful thanks this morning for the glory of this day, for Reverend John, for our leadership council, for our musicians and the beautiful gifts they share with us. And I give grateful thanks for every person in this room and joining from afar as we support each other as we journey through this life. I give thanks and together we say, and so it is. Well, I was fortunate enough to hike into fields of wildflowers two mornings this week. The hillsides were blanketed with a wall-to-wall -wall carpet of brilliant swaths of yellow, white, blue, pink, and purple. The air was filled with the sweetest perfumed fragrance. Birds were singing, and a stately line of antelope ambled along an adjacent trail as I started out. Everything was in order, perfect divine in its nature. We each have our own way of picturing that divine life force that you may call God, Mother Nature, the order behind the cosmos, or whatever is your word of choice. For me, taking in the per perfection of those hillsides says it all. There can be no debate in my mind that an extraordinary power exists, turning the seeds into flowers, no matter the winter they have endured. For me, there are great lessons in observing the seasons, in patiently and steadfastly believing that in the dark days of our life, beneath the snow lie seeds and bulbs that will burst forth with a profusion of brilliance and beauty. I came home from my hike more curious about wildflowers from a spiritual perspective. I, rem I learned of the Bible reference to the lilies of the field. I found Christian websites selling t-shirts saying, consider how the wildflowers grow. An Instagram post said simply, wildflowers are my religion. And a book entitled Meet Me in the Meadow, Finding God in the Wildflowers, included the thought that these plants don't preach sermons, shout praises, or quote scripture. But the Lord designed their pattern, and I imagine him as a glass blower or cabinet maker, carefully designing each flower drawing from his eternity of beauty, purity, and knowledge, divine sources beyond my comprehension. Wildflowers provide a glimpse of God. I couldn't agree more. I hope each of us is able to find a holy place such as the one I experienced this week, whether you go to a physical place or into an image in your mind. You go to a place for renewal, for rejoicing, for getting ourselves back to center, one with the divine. I hope this place provides the promise of spring, particularly in the darkest days. For me, a field of wildflowers does the trick, and so does one of my favorite Bible verses from Song of Solomon. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle 
is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth the green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so it is. And now we shift gears to the affirmation, which is printed on the insert um, included in the program. And I remember when I took Pratt class from Reverend Bob, he always said it wasn't the words that mattered, it was the feeling behind them. Um, I remember you saying, Bob, that we didn't have to write long, long spiritual prayers. We just really needed a few words if we said them like we really meant them. So I invite you to do that. I look within and set intentions through prayer and then step forward in action to help transform the world. I don't hit anything early. <laughs> morning, everybody. It's good to see you this Pacific Northwesty kind of morning, kind of. So there was a story I was going to tell in a few more minutes, but Jana's story reminded us that I'm going to tell it right now. But first, I want to talk about community today and what makes a community. And we've had, there was a story that was told last week, and it was not just that particular person's story, but it's a story that um, has been told a few times here, that over the years we've had, I don't know, five, six, seven people who had experienced cancer, obviously many more than that, but something about their treatment that there was a period of time that they needed to travel daily to Twin Falls. And people at home, that's 70 miles away if you're not local. So we've got our nice little hospital here, but they can only do so much. And first of all, I can't imagine, for one thing, having an experience of cancer and treatment, let alone having to daily travel 70 miles. And so for these group, different people through the years, and not just the person that shared the story last week, um, we put together a list who would like to sign up to go to Twin Falls and to get on that daily thing. And I, I think the treatments last different amounts of time, but I remember one was like three or four weeks. And that's a, that's a lot of trips to Twin Falls. Even I can't go to Costco that much. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, whoever thought they would say those words? Even I can't go to Costco that much. But the reason why I'm relating this story is that each person who had that gift told me how it made the experience they're going through so special. In fact, it was a highlight of their lives to have people in service to them to drive them every day. And, and with this calendar of a different person every day, it was usually people they didn't even know. And we kind of reached out even beyond light in the mountains. And then in talking through the years to the people who were the drivers, getting the same story, that it was a highlight of their life to be able to be in service to someone, often someone they didn't know, and how amazing things happened on a daily basis on these daily trips to Twin Falls. And it was, it was so cute. I just a few weeks ago talked to another person who had, had had this happen, and she doesn't even live here anymore. She still talks about it. I think she moved away from here like 10 years ago. She still talks about the drives to Twin Falls. And she says, you know, People were almost kind of embarrassed and wanting to need to go to Costco. And I just told them, you know, it's okay, I need a nap. Go to Costco. I'll lay in the back of your car. Get whatever you need. As long as you don't put your bags on top of me, I'm good. <laughs> but to me, that is why we're here. That's community. There's so many things that we can do that are even smaller gestures. So last week, I believe we had, at least I did, a reminder of community and how community is a constant series of endings and beginnings. There, there is a cycle. And sometimes there, these endings and beginnings are kind of sneaky. They just show up. And sometimes they are hel heralded through with a big a moment or event. And endings and beginnings can be something we celebrate, <clears throat> and they can be something sometimes we dread, sometimes we think is, is the worst thing that ever happened in that moment, but they're here for a reason to teach us something. Interesting first about endings. I think a lot of times we think about endings as 
something that we would prefer possibly not to happen. Sometimes seemingly out of control of our personal control, even though I believe we invite everything in our life on some level. But sometimes an ending can bring great grief into our lives. Like how could that possibly had hap it happened? Sometimes endings are things we actually bring on that we look forward to. The last few years, haven't we said, I can't wait for this to end. Let's have an ending. Let's do something else. This just, it's like Groundhog's Day. We get up and it's still not ended yet. So why can't we do something different? And then of course, again, often beginnings, we, we work towards them. Um, last night I facilitated a wedding at one of my favorite spots on the beach at Redfish Lake. I, I do a lot of weddings up there yes. from people from all over the country. And of course there is this great celebration, even if it's just the, the couple like last night, this idea of starting their, their, new, their lives together and probably having no idea what that means. In the ceremony I used last night at one of my closing words, um, I don't know, as they say, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, the line is, um, the vows you have just spoken have changed the form of your lives together. I mean, forever. I mean, again, a blessing and a curse. It's changed. We've brought this on and, oh, there's change. We brought this on. And I think in a new relationship, whether it is a marriage type relationship or any other relationship we have that we've committed to on some form, that line is true. The form of your lives have changed forever. And again, as a two-sided coin. Some things that we are celebratory in, it, in the change and others maybe not so much. Or we realize that as wonderful as this is, oh, there's this other thing that I really have to say goodbye to or I can't do any longer. So it can seemingly be a mixed bag. But to realize that in some way, some form, we have said yes to it all. And I know that's, that's hard to understand sometimes, to say that I have said yes to everything that came into my life. And again, not as a way of, of guilt or shame. I mean, how do you say yes to cancer? It just didn't say, oh, that sounds like good on the brochure to pick today. We don't do that. But I think we say yes to the type of lessons and learning that we have. As I think, again, of some of our, our friends that had daily trips to Twin Falls, I think they said yes to transformational relationships of, from people and to be gifted from people that they didn't even know. I think, wow, what an amazing thing to say yes to. Uh, the other thing we judge is not so good, but in each instance they had transformational things within them that may not have easily have occurred if it wasn't for the form of their life they were experiencing at that time. So it's a big mystery of why does this show up? Who knows? I don't know. Like I often will say, the question isn't why did it show up, but what are you going to do with it now? That's all we, we can do. Well, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, who cares? It's here. What are we going to do? So, again, last week I was reminded a lot of endings and beginnings. And I wrote a bit about this in my blog, that last week I was really aware of a significant ending that we all experienced a couple years ago, individually, in groups, as a world. And the one that I w wrote about was the last Sunday we met as a congregation in March of 2020 before we had to close our doors. And it was a weird, not weird, it was an odd energy that day. Seven, eight, nine, ten people showed up. We didn't know if we should even be showing up. You know, is at that time what, what, what's going on? There's things that are frightening in, in, in the news. And it was pretty clear from what was happening that we were going to have to shut our doors like so many other people. And there was definitely, as I think back, this feeling of an ending that where we were before <coughs> was no longer, and the anxiety of, in a sense, knowing that we were in a beginning of something and having no idea what that beginning was. And, and something that we weren't joyfully inviting into our lives as a beginning, but like it or not, this is the beginning you have. And here you go. And of course, 
so many things ended and began with that period of time leading us up to now. And why, I don't know. As I've said many times, I think it led us into a period of, of great introspection of saying what's going on in my life, what's going on in the world, what's going on into our community and groups like our faith communities, what, what's really important, what are we really up to. But last Saturday, I had a great sense of beginnings in a good way. So last Sunday, many of you were here, and some of you now at home that were here last week, and it was nice to see you in person last week. Back to the bathrobe. Um, <laughs> but we had a great guest, Reverend Marquita, um, and she was wonderful, and she, she sang, she talked, she did everything. But what some, many of you did not experience was the real reason why we brought her here, which was to help facilitate a leadership retreat which was the Friday evening and all day Saturday, the day before. And there were about 18 of us that came that day. Um, our leadership council, past leadership council people, and a couple other random people to have kind of a, I guess, let's call it a quorum, or representation of all of you. And for me, some amazing things happened. Now, the purpose of this was to create some intentions and goals and a real action plan. But before that could happen, some other things needed to happen. So just think in your own life, when you have set intentions or goals or anything along that line, and sometimes they really worked out well and you followed through, and other times they sounded great at 10 p.m. but not so great at 8 a.m. the next morning. We've had those as well. It's like, oh, this sounds great. And like with your friends when you're 20s. We'll meet you at brunch at 7. You never meet at brunch at 7. Never happens. Sounds great at 2 o'clock in the morning, but you don't do it. It's never going to happen. So something had to happen first before we could even talk about stepping out in action in the world as a spiritual community. And what needed to happen is that we had to remember what it was like to be a community. Think of that in your own life. The last couple years have trained us that when we go somewhere, go do what you need to do and leave as quickly as possible. Don't interact. Don't talk to people unless you're 10 feet apart. And just get out of there. And even we now have been meeting in person for several months. And that's been a challenge in that we kind of don't know what to do with each other anymore. Um, I, I think people finally realized you could stay for a cup of coffee afterwards and the world wouldn't fall apart. But it was even like, there's a social hall, people gather in there, they do stuff in there, what do you mean? I was just going to get in my car and, you know, by the last bar of the song, have my engine running and be out, be out uh, you know, out on the highway. I mean, that's kind of the consciousness we've had to really embrace these last couple years for very good reasons, but to, in a sense, know that we can do things a little bit differently now takes some relearning. And not to say that everything is over or done, but it's still different and we can step forward in a community in, I think, an expanded way now. So let me tell you how Reverend Marquita helped us remember. First of all, there were 18 of us in a circle in the social hall, which is something that has not happened in over two years. Let me just think of that. It's pretty amazing, the intention that brought us together. The windows were wide open and the doors were open just in case there was something lurking around, but we were there. And it was amazing to be in each other's presence and ask ourselves, well, why are we here? Why is it important? But the first thing that we did that Marquita led us through was actually, in a sense, a bit of play. We haven't played together in forever. We don't know how to do that anymore. And this, this was so simple and so fun. And, and you, you could probably do this if you have like a dinner party or something. It was really a lot of fun. So she gave us all like these little card, index card kind of things. She said, now write something on it that you're pretty sure that no one in this room knows about you. I mean, just, and I'm not going to ask you to share. You, you might share over coffee because the room is open in there afterwards. You might come up with something and ask someone else like, okay, what do I not know about you? And so 
Marquita collected them, and one by one she read them, and it was like we have to guess who it was. I was really, what's that old game show when I was a kid? Like, what's my line? Like, they tried, all pretended they were something, and like, oh, who's the real person? Well, it was that. And sometimes we'd go through like 10 people, like, was it you? No, was it you? And we'd have instances where we'd say, well, I did do that, but that's not my card. <laughs> and even though we were sworn to confidentiality, there's one that a little, a little dirt I have to tell you. So one person wrote down that, um, that their secret was that they had spent the night in jail in, when they were younger. And we kept going around, was it you, was it you, was it you? And I can't tell you how many people actually said, not my card, but yes, actually I've been in jail. <laughs> so I want you to know that there's a high percentage of these nameless people, I won't tell you who in the other room, who has spent time in jail, and these people are leading us all. <laughs> and somehow that is appropriate. <laughs> in some weird, odd, sick way, that just seems to be appropriate. So, well, I'm not going to give any names, but we'll move on from there. Darn. Darn. Well, <laughs> And, and it was just fun. We got to learn some things from people. Some of these things were very fun, and some were very vulnerable. Like, you didn't know this difficult thing about me, and yet I'm willing to share it with everyone. And it was wonderful. And that led into, again, the thing that we really did to set the foundation of remembering how to be a community. And she invited us, as many as possible, who to share something of why they're here. I mean, really, why are you part of this spiritual community? Why, after all these years, you st still come back? Why, after this kind of hiatus of being in community together, did you say yes to coming here on this day to help vision and set intentions for this community? And so many people had the story like I related earlier of the several people that we've supported in going to Twin Falls. And things that weren't, I guess you'd say, officially part of our, our ministry, where we had a sign-up sheet, like, are you willing to do this? Just instances of people being in very quietly and sometimes discreetly in service to each other. That didn't make the paper, didn't make it an announcement on Sunday, but someone was so moved that by someone else that they knew that this had to be their spiritual home. And another person related that was not only their experience, but how it's been experience of many people through the years that on their first few visits, of course, coming in here like, what is this place? You know, let me sit in the back row because in case it's too weird, I can get out really pretty quickly. <laughs> but spending their first couple times here just in the back row in tears that something happened here that broke open their heart. And even if they didn't know everyone yet, they still felt it was safe, a safe place that they could do that. So for all of us that are here today and those of that, the many people that are at home, to ask ourselves, why are we still here? We've made it through a couple difficult years and again, it's not over, over. We're still here, and why didn't we just kind of float away? Why are we here? You know, I call it the, the why that makes you cry, in a sense. That, that deep thing that, that you learned something, that you healed something, you were served, you were in service to someone else, and it connected you to this larger group of people um, in ways that's permanent, in a sense. So as we move forward, and as we have set some goals, the most important thing for us now is, in a sense, I believe, to recommit as a community and remember why we have been here, and to know that that's not just the past, but that is our present and our future. And for us to be what I call an intentional community. And what, what, what does that mean? So it, again, in the last couple of years, it, it's been so easy to be so fragmented and kind of just loners lurking about in the world and to realize that we don't need to do that anymore. And that 
even though we will be asking and inviting people to help in the physical action of our goals and intentions, that the first thing that we need to do is the work we need to do in consciousness. To remember that everything is always created twice and on two levels. Everything you see in the physical world was first a thought and intention. And it was not only a thought and intention, it took a person or group of people to say, we can do that. It sounds crazy, it sounds impossible, it's never been done before, but there was that essence of, of energy and a raising of consciousness that said, I think we can do it anyway. And that's what it takes, both as individuals and us as a spiritual community, as a group, to say that we have no idea what these last two years are about, but here we are, and we can be in an intentional community. It looks really a lot different than it did a couple years ago, but here we are. And part of that is not just you know, repeating an affirmation or an idea. It literally is raising the vibrational level of who we are. And what does that mean, even? So if we were to, and we're not going to do this, go around one by one and ask you to tell an inspirational story of either why you are here or something that so moved you in other parts of our life, you would notice as we went from person to person that you would feel elevated, wouldn't you? I mean, there's nothing like an inspirational story to just to make you feel good about life and that something you thought that was impossible is actually possible. And if we, again, like we did last Saturday, if we went around the room and told stories specifically about our community over the last 30 odd years of, of amazing things that have happened and things you learned, healings that you had, without even trying, our vibrational level will have reached a higher level. So the way that we move forward is to invite that higher frequency without having to bring it on with a having stories told in a group. It's in your spiritual practice each and every day to have your spiritual community part of that spiritual practice to affirm that we are all in this time and difficulty in the world raising our vibration to be a community in the next step of who we can be. To know that it started last week with 18 of us and it can grow even more with those who are here today and at home viewing, and to realize that the key is in that belief in raising of energy. Now, a lot of times when we want to do things or anything, the first thing that we can come up against is the reason why we can't. We don't have enough people, we don't have enough money, we don't have the right resources, we don't have any number of things. But when you rise to that higher vibration, it is amazing how things you thought that weren't available are actually available. And it actually has you realize or even look at where you are and understand the resources that are maybe even underutilized that you have right in front of you. Reverend Makita also asked us to realize what are our gifts and opportunities right here. You know, one of the, the one that I think that we take for granted now, that we didn't a few years ago, is just this building. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into getting this building. If you weren't here when this happened, you have no idea what it took, the growth in consciousness to go from saying we never can to why the heck not that we can't? We, there's no reason why we can't. And that's what it really took then. And it really was this elevation of community and consciousness that said, we've been waiting for other people to come here and do it for us long enough. We're going to do it right now. It's going to happen. Guess what? It happened. And even in talking to Reverend Marquita on the side, that you know, her community is about five years old, and their frustration, they're all virtual right now. They don't have even a lease space. And she says, John, what did it take for you guys to get here? And again, we take this for granted sometimes. She says, well, we kind of figured it out at year 15, that we are just sick and tired of making excuses. And this happened before I came, and just said we're going to do it. 
I said, you don't necessarily have to wait till year 15, but you do have to get to that point to say, there's absolutely no reason that we can't do this. The only thing standing in the way is our belief that we can't. And again, the moment that the consensus here was that we could do this, it happened. It was frustrating and there were roadblocks and there was but it happened. The other opportunity that we have and, and her frustration of trying to you know, get a newer community up. So on Saturday, we had potluck salad bar. And if somebody, Marquita says, you guys do food really well here, don't you? And I said, I'm not sure what they do where she comes from. But she said, no, we do food really well here. In fact, it would be cranky if we didn't do food really well here. And so I keep running this here. And we were done with lunch, and it was really time to kind of go and segue to our afternoon. And this is nothing magical. People spontaneously just got up and cleaned up and got things ready, and there were people in the kitchen, and Marquita said, they just did that without anyone asking them, didn't they? Something told me that she had to ask where she comes from. I said, well, yeah. When we see a place where we can serve, we have a tendency here to do it. That is one of our big strengths. And even when we get distracted, like in the last couple years, and we may feel even almost separated from our group, as we come together now to realize that we serve without asking. Yes, there are times that we ask. There's nothing like the dreaded sign-up list on the clipboard, you know, <laughs> that we need something. <laughs> but we have a tendency to do it without being asked. And so as we move forward in these with these new goals and intentions, I know that as we are ready to take physical steps, that you will step forward and serve. But I think what we need now is to reestablish that concept and that idea within us that I individually and collectively are here to serve. And to know the power that group intention has and how it will transform even further our community. So one thing I've been, been thinking of this week, if you've noticed, is it here? If you look at here, you've seen this so many times, you don't even, probably don't even see it anymore. It says, welcome home. In a lot of our literature, we have that. Welcome home. Let this be your spiritual home. And my challenge to all of us now is that it's time to come home. It's time to come home. And whichever level that you can right now, I know some of us physically if, with our health issues still need to be a bit distant and you still need to protect yourself and do exactly what you need to do, but we still in consciousness and most of us physically can come home now. And I think it's time to come home. And even those of you at home, I know that some, many of you live far away, you can still in a sense come home and consciousness, that we've been led to believe that all things, including spiritual, spiritual community, is somehow a TV show. And again, nothing against us wonderful live streamers. But we've, we've created this barrier that somehow it's this thing that we observe, as opposed to something that we take part in. And it can be, I think, at first seemingly a difficult habit and pattern to break. It's so easy just to observe. But that's not how spiritual community is made. You know, there is a, what I call a fallacy around in nonprofits and spiritual community um, that some people put forth. They say, you know, this is a great place, but we, I don't want to ask much of you. Just, just, do, just do a little bit here. Just, you know, it's, it's almost like, let's think small. Like, oh, just come every once in a while and, you know, say hi to someone every once in a while. But the most successful nonprofits and faith communities are ones that ask more. And it's not that I personally am calling you up to ask you to do stuff. It's you're asking more from within the consciousness of our organization to say that there is something of such great value here that I want to give more of myself and to be of service to my fellow people here that are here, that are home, that are in our larger community, that I'm here to show up. It's not about asking less, it's about asking more. 
It's about challenging ourselves at this point in history to give more. And I'm not just saying financially. I'm saying you giving more to each other, giving more to yourself, knowing what is possible within yourself right now, giving more to your larger community. Like I've, I've said this many times, I've as I talk to people who are not members here, I run into them and says, I'm not sure what you do there, but I'm glad you're doing it because it's amazing. And it's because of all of you. The interactions of you willing to show up in service in ways large and small. So as we move forward now, I'd like to think of this as a time of turning the page. A time that we are holding our energy at a higher energy and actually saying, I'm here to give more of myself that we've all held back for a while. It's time to move forward. If we do that, and it's not if, as we do that, <laughs> these goals and action plans are like, it's such a done deal. I mean, it's like not even a concern. And not only those things, if you look in the social hall, there's like a million things listed of things we could do. We picked out the most important, even the things that seemingly were not as important because we thought we have to give it energy to the most important. They will happen with great ease and sometimes without even a discussion because we're here to up the game and up our energy and say, in a sense, send me. I'm willing to give more of myself. And I think that's what is being called for in the world right now. So it's not just about coming here and, in a sense, giving more of ourselves on Sunday morning. It's a commitment to do this in every place we are in our lives. It's a commitment to do it in Costco. It's a commitment to do it with the crabby visitor who is wreaking havoc at Atkinson's. It's be, yeah, a lot of them. Um, it, it is just saying, <laughs> I'm here to be of service in some way, large and small, as a, also a representative of light in the mountains, but also just as a representative of the human place, of human race. And just remember, it's, you know, my invitation to all of you is, it's time to come home. And let's see what happens with this. So please, every day in your prayer or spiritual practice, if you could imagine all of us together in prayer at one moment, like we are here today, thinking of elevating the energy to greater service and that we are coming home. So in, in, let's just close our eyes for a second and just kind of change what I do a little bit at the end here. So bring to mind right now a time here in your connection to light on the mountains that you felt served in a way that it just blew you away. It could have been a, a simple conversation. It could have been something like being driven to Twin Falls, but just bring to mind a time that you felt that you were served and so grateful for it. And then think of a time where you spontaneously served yourself. Not, it could have been something to f through light on the mountains. It could have been in the community. But you just had that energy of being served that you couldn't help but to return it somewhere else in the community. How did that feel? And in that feel, the elevation of the energy and consciousness in the room right now. Feel the connection with the people who are at home right now viewing, doing this along with us right in this moment or later in this week. And that the more we discuss or concentrate on it, how that energy and consciousness grows and expands. So in our prayer for our community, remember this feeling. And we recreate it at least once a day in your quiet moments. That is our first step, in a sense, coming home. We are reestablishing who we are as we move forward. And in this intention, 
know that you are literally changing the world. At, its, at the cellular level, you are changing the world. And be grateful knowing that's exactly what we need right now. And so it is.